Okay, so yeah, so we're moving on now to the last four talks, which are in the field of environmental magnetism. And as you can see, our next speaker, Priyashu uh, Srivastava from uh, <laughs> Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, will be presenting um, uh, characterizing highland laterites with the deck and traps using environmental uh, magnetism. So over to you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about my topic. And uh, so I'm Priyeshu and I'm doing postdoc at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I'm visiting INGV room for a very short time. So I'm going to present a topic which uh, was not specifically funded, but uh, out of curiosity. So I will be presenting uh, some results which I generated in uh, Sao Paulo. Okay, I think. Well, okay. Yeah, okay. So laterites or lateritization topic is, is quite old. It's been more than 200 years in the literature, but it is still uh, quite controversial in terms of geochemistry. People are still, uh, uh, fighting over the terms of lateritization and ferric critization. And uh, so I'm going to present what we know about laterites and ferric crits and how this terminology is being confused over the time. So this is an ideal profile of laterite uh, in the A section, but this is quite uncommon in the natural environment. And this is the second diagram which shows that how we can differentiate the term laterite and ferric crete. So if we have uh, autochthonous input, there is no uh, allochthonous input or any other sources of iron in the, or any other uh, material in the laterite. So it can be completely called laterite. And if we increase towards the 100% sources of uh, different sources than the in situ alteration, uh, we call the term ferric crete. However, in nature, it's not, uh, entirely true. So what we know about the laterites in Deccan Trap. So Deccan Trap, we know the age, it's uh, 66 million years and the laterites were developed afterwards, but uh, we don't have any absolute age for laterites of the Deccan Trap, but there are some uh, ages on the laterites which were developed in the uh, Archean rocks of the Western India, which is exposed in the, in the uh, uh, Simoga, Sandur, and Goa regions. And these dates indicated uh, three, uh, three stages of alteration or three types of uh, laterite formations. One is uh, somewhat uh, in the early Paleogene and then the other stages of alteration, which was in the early Eocene uh, or when the uh, onset of Asian monsoon happened around 35 million years ago. And we can also see that the paleo latitude in this region was crossing the Copian A climate belt, where uh, precipitation was higher than evaporation, and that's when we have a huge amount of laterite formation in the in the western, western as well as eastern uh, South Indian uh, terrains. Okay, so iron sources in laterite has been. Uh, there, there have been two models which, which tells about the laterite formations on the Deccan trap. One is the continuous alteration, in situ alteration, which was, pro, uh, which was uh, proposed by Widowson and Cox, I think in 1998, 97. And then the latter model says that uh, while, uh, while iron was in C2 as well as it was from the lateral enrichment through the fluvial input, interfluvial input, and which and then the further erosion led to the modern day topography of uh, the contrap where we can see ferric crete capped uh, mesas or ferric crete uh, trapped uh, high reliefs of the Deccan trap. Then there are other sources for uh, different elements in the in the laterites, and which has been uh, suggested using the neodymium isotopes as well as high field strengthening element. And these three uh, are the prominent sources which can uh, induce more dust into into the laterite during its alteration and contributing to the laterite formations. Okay, so this is a field photograph. Uh, 
uh, of the same of the section we studied this is the top relief of the ferricrete and this is one of the uh, road cutting section exposed in the patan area patan is uh, in the bamnoli range which is very very uh, famous for the high uh, ferricrete uh, tops of the basalt so megascopic features we can see there are different different uh, features such as nodular uh, spheroids, and then at the top we have more and more porous limonitic nature. In in this part, we can also see a little bit of boxitization being being done or being formed in this part. One of my colleagues did the ore microphotography of this section, where we can also see very very different uh, colors as well as uh, uh, inclusions in it. Some of them are having limonitic filling. Uh, then more and more uh, darkish and blackish uh, hematite being being formed there, as well as some of the saprolytic fragments. So, so my question was how we can uh, uh, understand these processes using environmental magnetic method, which has not been done till now in in, in this type of settings in in in, in the contraps. So we studied first, we characterized this profile using uh, geochemistry. We used uh, index of lateralization, which is IOL, and then uh, chemical index of alteration, mafic index of alteration. What we can see from the chemistry that uh, just after the fresh basalt, we can see very, very high chemical weathering of these, these uh, saprolite and ferricrete samples. And then when we can see index of lateralization, it increases towards the top of the profile and we checked also the mobility of uh, different relatively immobile and mobile elements and where we can see more than 100% loss of uh, obviously more mobile elements such as uh, sodium magnesium where silica is almost uh, lost up to 50% in the middle of section and as we progress towards the top it is also gone for almost 100%. However, if we look at relatively immobile element of which iron, iron is of very particular importance, it shows very, very erratic behavior because at certain point in the middle of the profile, it, it is 100% lost, whereas it gains more than 100, more than 400 percentage from the, from the Deccan uh, protolith in its content. So it, 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 it gives how how this much of percentage of iron is being being produced at certain levels in the in the profile so we measured uh, routine magnetic parameters such as susceptibility uh, arm s ratio and uh, and coercivity of remnants and high hirm as well for the characterization of different parameters what we can see there is a clearly uh, increasing trend at, at the beginning when the alteration started or or in the basalt or saprolytic zone. And when we go towards the top part, we see almost negligible or very low concentration of uh, magnetic minerals, specifically ferrimagnetic minerals. That can be also being seen from the S ratio. A very sharp jump can be also seen in coercivity of remnants. Okay, so we also did the uh, quantification of hematite and goethite using diffuse reflectance spectroscopy. And we tried to also extract the pyrogenic susceptibility by using the citrate bicarbonate dithionite extraction method. Uh, in this, we can see again, like what we saw in the geochemical behavior, we can see at certain point hematite is, is totally absent, whereas uh, uh, goethite uh, is present, really, really high concentration, but that cannot be seen in the other uh, rock magnetic parameters or the routinely magnetic parameters like uh, susceptibility and ARM. And redness uh, or the color characterization follows the typical hematite pattern. We can see that the hematite seems to be controlling the color distribution of the, these uh, laterite or ferricrete samples. And again, we see the kaipedo in the basalt, it is uh, negative. Obviously, we don't expect much of the pedogenic uh, magnetic minerals in the, in the fresh basalts, but as the alteration in the saprolite 
progresses, we see very high kaipedo, and then again, we lose all the pedogenic uh, magnetic minerals in the laterite and ferric grid zone. So to characterize the magnetic mineralogy and how it changes, I am presenting here the thermal susceptibility data, which was measured in the argon environment. And these are the saprolytic zone where we can see two big humps. One is starting at around 200 degrees with the peak around 250 and 30 and 300. And then again, we see the very sharp decline around 560 or 570 degrees Celsius. So this hump has been, been very, very curious uh, feature of this uh, uh, saprolite as well as the Deccan basalt. So recent studies shows that these hump can be either from the low titanium magnetite, or it can be also from the very, very fine uh, ferrimagnetic particles being present in the samples. And it can be seen even in the fresh basalt. What we see there is a change is in the peak uh, as we progress towards the top or towards the more uh, uh, alteration part towards the top, we can see there is a shift in the, in the uh, peak temperature as well. While we can see in the laterite and ferricrete, it's very, very, very distinguished feature we can see. Uh, for example, there are the samples where we have very, very, or almost no hematite, we can see very, very we can see very, weak signatures, whereas the samples where we have very high hematite, we can see very, the strong peak around 680 or 90 degrees Celsius, the kneel temperature of hematite. So hysteresis was also done on these samples. And then we can see the clear changes from uh, typical uh, course or PhD particle behavior towards the more uh, was based signature in the saprolite itself, where we can say that, okay, mixed signature was being formed. And when we can see the laterite and ferricrete shown, at certain point, we again see this signature of uh, bimodal population of magnetic mineral where we have uh, low coercivity as well as high coercivity mineral. And most of the samples, uh, so almost goose uh, neck, neck behavior where we have very broad or very high coercive uh, antiferromagnetic minerals. So we also did some fork measurements on these samples uh, and where we can see there is a change in the parent, parent rock towards the, uh, towards the top where we can see, I think, uh, I'm not uh, an expert in the fork measurements yet, but I think there is a change in the in the green size from uh, bottom towards the top based on the magnetic interactions as well as the change in the loop. It, it gets more interesting in the laterite and ferricrete zone where we can see again reappearance of uh, low coercive ferrimagnetic minerals, whereas we can see very strong uh, hematitic or antiferromagnetic signature, which has coercivity, more, uh, coercivity range from 200 to 600 millitesla. And when, when we go towards the top of the profile, we lose these signatures as was seen in the, uh, in the data of, uh, in, in the quantified uh, hematite data where we can see there is a decline in the, in the concentration. And as we go towards the top, we lose almost all the hematite uh, in the top samples. So to conclude our uh, preliminary data is that most of the behavior of uh, uh, ferricrete zone is, 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 is quite distinct where we can see there are some samples where we have this accumulation of uh, ferrimagnetic as well as antiferromagnetic and as at some sample, at some prof, at some levels where we lose all these uh, uh, signatures. So probably this, to conclude my findings, is that probability that is that while while the vertical migration of uh, iron oxide was happening during the intense weathering, we also see the enrichment of lateral enrichment of uh, iron through the through the interflow of this model. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, do we have any 
questions on the line of the audience? Some very nice hematite folks in there. <laughs> Not seeing any questions here, but uh, yeah. So, so uh, yeah, great. Do you uh, use that actually? Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. So, I'm just looking at these forks. Um, I guess you're probably missing a huge amount of your hematite component um, because you're probably maybe not getting up to um, high enough fields um, with, with, with the four diagrams. But it's interesting that you still, <coughs> you still actually see these relatively low coercivity components in, 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 in the laterites. Um, is that actually giving us some kind of indication that there is some overlap in the mineralogy uh, with the saponitic zone, or is this an indication of um, perhaps substitution between the, the uh, harder goatites and, and hematites that are then reducing the course of base? Okay, so if I Okay, so if I clearly understood your question, because uh, there, there was some uh, distortion in the voice, is that in the laterite, in the fork diagram, we see either the mixture of mineralogy or whether it is the change in the particle size was, was it the question? Yeah. Okay, so uh, <coughs> what I see that in the laterite, it's, it's not very uniform, itself uh, what we see from the or microscopy and these these data obviously so i measured the up to one tesla uh, this process this this has been uh, the result is presented up to 800 milli tesla in the in the in the coercivity range if we look at the 28.5 meter sample this is uh, this seems it's mostly dominant uh, ferrimagnetic uh, behavior where we have the uh, the coercivity range around 40 30 to 35 millitesla but when we see in the in this 32 and 34 meter where we see the range is very very high probably and when we look at the other data to confirm this uh, this is uh, the 32 centimeter uh, 32 meter sample where we see almost uh, if you can see the iron gain so this is more than 400% uh, increase compared to what was the in the protolith content. And then again, if we see the uh, this sample where we have very, very high hematite. So probably this is behavior from the change in the, from the mineralogy, but I cannot confirm whether it is the change from a combined effect of both hematite and goethite, but I think it's mostly more related with the change in the mineralogy in these, at least in the, in the laterite zone. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think, yeah, okay. Hassan had exactly the same question. Okay. Anyway, well, yeah, thank you to uh, PSU. Thank you so much.